My name is David Messenger. I'm at the Rochester Institute of Technology in a department called the Center for Imaging Science. Um, in the Center for Imaging Science, I'm the director of the Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Lab, one of the research focus areas within the field of imaging science. Um, so I run the, the Remote Sensing Lab, which um, is primarily looking at remote sensing imaging systems, actually building hardware and deploying them on airplanes, modeling and simulation of various imaging systems, either ground-based or space-based or airborne platforms, um, as well as looking at ways of extracting information out of imagery to support decision makers um, at all sorts of levels. Um, we fund graduate students um, primarily in imaging science, but also in fields such as mathematics, physics, computer science, um, computer engineering, those sorts of things as well, working on various aspects of the remote sensing problems. There are lots of different modalities of imagery that we work with. If you're working with uh, space-based, multispectral, um, commercially available imagery. The imagery is, is quite good nowadays, um, um, but you always have to deal with issues of resolution. Two meter pixels on the ground are, are really great. You can get a lot of information out of them. In some cases that makes it more difficult because you, the world is a lot more complicated when you look at higher spatial resolution than if you're looking at the 30 meter pixels associated with something more like Landsat. So in both multispectral and hyperspectral imaging systems, as the sensors have gotten a lot better and the spatial resolution has gotten a lot better and the spectral resolution has gotten a lot better, the world is a lot more complicated and we're, uh, we're investigating some new mathematical approaches from the um, data mining community, from the graph theory community, computational topology, those sorts of uh, issues or um, fields to develop new methods to extract quantitative information out of the data, to um, have algorithms and methodologies that don't levy as many assumptions on the data about their statistical properties or their radiometric conditions and, and things like that. And it's driven by uh, the proliferation of these sensors. The fact that you can now get uh, um, commercially available data from companies such as Digital Globe and GOI that um, cover every part of the world every week or so means that you have access to um, long time series of high, high resolution, um, high radiometric quality data to allow you to do things like precision agriculture, to study um, changes in urban development. Um, of course, there's a whole host of sort of defense applications. Um, there, we're seeing more and more growth on the environmental side of um, applications as well, both over large areas as well as over very targeted areas over shorter time spans. Um, so there's a whole host of applications um, in terms of uh, you're seeing more and more people, more and more people at the state and local level using remotely sensed data um, in their policy making, their decision making, in disaster response, those sorts of things. As part of our uh, disaster response. In 2010, we flew one of our airborne systems over the earthquake in Haiti um, under funding from the World Bank. The goal was to collect high resolution uh, color infrared imagery that was very accurately geolocated so we could produce high resolution image derived maps, um, as well as a, there was a, a 3D imaging LIDAR system on the same aircraft. So we were able to produce both high resolution color imagery along with a 3D image of the ground all off the same platform. Uh, we flew our sensor for about seven days, covered about 250 square miles, generated over a terabyte worth of data, which was then delivered back to the World Bank, to the United Nations and all sorts of uh, NGOs and other government agencies who are still to this day using the data to help in the relief efforts in Haiti. More recently, um, we have flown our imaging sensor after, let's see, both Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee struck upstate New York in the fall of 2011, um, both causing major flooding. Um, Hurricane Irene f had major flooding in eastern New York, just south of Albany, and we flew our imaging sensor there to help the state in assessing the damage. And then about a month later, Tropical Storm Lee came up through the center of the country and caused major flooding in the Binghamton, New York area. For that particular flood, um, we were contacted by the state on um, Friday morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and given the authorization to actually deploy 
We were able to install our sensor in an airplane and actually deploy to Binghamton, which is only an hour or so away from us, um, fly the system, uh, land the airplane, do all the post-processing on the data and deliver it back to New York State within about 8 to 12 hours after we had gotten the official go-ahead to, to uh, launch the mission. And that imagery was used by a number of people at the state to do both their um, uh, planning for their relief efforts as well as to do things like identify spills on the water, um, trafficability studies for various bridges and roads, as well as also just to generate, generally understand the overall level of the damage. There is um, there's the old phrase that we're swimming in data, but we're, um, we're lacking information. And how do you um, extract information from these huge amounts of data that are being collected all the time? My group has done some work in developing algorithms to try and assess um, for very large imagery, uh, spatially, locally, more complex areas such that we can sort of sort the data for um, analysis later on. We've done this primarily with um, multispectral imagery. Um, I know a lot of people are working on the same sorts of techniques for all sorts of data types from full motion video to um, radar imagery to all sorts of types of things.